Good morning and welcome to Wednesday's Together for Christ podcast, looking at the first part of 1 Kings chapter 2, the last words of King David to his son Solomon, who it's now clear is going to succeed him as king. In chapter 1 on Monday and Tuesday, we saw a failed attempt by Adonijah, another of David's sons, to seize the throne. But it's now become clear to the whole nation that Solomon is the correct successor. And now David hands over the throne to him. So we will take time to read that together after we have prayed. Gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have planned and prepared our future. That there is a place in heaven that you have prepared for us to be with you and all those whom you love forever. And in the meantime, you have purposes for us, good works for us to do. And we thank you that we are guided into that by your spirit. And we know that some of that guidance comes through your word. So as we turn to the Bible today and read from it, we ask that you would speak to us and place on our hearts and minds the things we need to know, to say, to feel, to do in the places that you put us today so that we might be witnesses to you and continue serving the purposes of your kingdom in the world. Hear our prayer and bless us together in Jesus' name. Amen. When David's time to die approached, he charged his son Solomon saying, I am about to go the way of all the earth, but you be strong, show what you're made of and do what God tells you. Walk in the paths he shows you. Follow the life map, absolutely. Keep an eye out for the signposts, his course for life set out in the revelation to Moses. And then you'll get on well in whatever you do and wherever you go. And then God will confirm what he promised to me when he said, If your sons watch their step, staying true to my heart and soul, you'll always have a successor on Israel's throne. And don't forget what Joab, son of Zeruiah, did to the two commanders of Israel's army, to Abner, son of Ner, and to Amasa, son of Jether. He murdered them in cold blood, acting in peacetime as if he were at war and has been stained with that blood ever since. Do what you think best with him, but by no means let him get off scot-free. Make him pay. But be generous to the sons of Barzillai the Gileadite. Extend every hospitality to them. That's the way they treated me when I was running for my life from Absalom, your brother. You will also have to deal with Shimei, son of Gera, the Benjaminite from Bahurim, the one who cursed me so viciously when I was on my way to Mahanaim. Later, when he welcomed me back at the Jordan, I promised him under God, I won't put you to death. But neither should you treat him as if nothing ever happened. You're wise. You know how to handle these things. You'll know what to do to make him pay before he dies. And then David joined his ancestors. He was buried in the city of David. David ruled Israel for 40 years, seven years in Hebron and another 33 in Jerusalem. Solomon took over on the throne of his father David. He had a firm grip on the kingdom. Adonijah, son of Haggith, came to Bathsheba, Solomon's mother. She said, do you come in peace? He said, in peace. And then, may I say something to you? Go ahead, she said, speak. You know that I had the kingdom right at my hands, and everyone expected me to be the king. And then the whole thing backfired, and the kingdom landed in my brother's lap. God's doing. So now I have one request to ask of you. Please don't refuse me. Go ahead, ask, she said. Ask King Solomon, he won't turn you down, to give me Abishag the Shunammite as my wife. Certainly, said Bathsheba, I'll speak to the king for you. Bathsheba went to King Solomon to present Adonijah's request. The king got up and welcomed her, bowing respectfully, and returned to his throne. Then he had a throne put in place for his mother, and she sat at his right hand. She said, I have a small favour to ask of you. Don't refuse me. The king replied, Go ahead, mother. Of course I won't refuse you. She said, Give Abishag the Shunammite to your brother Adonijah as his wife. 
King Solomon answered his mother, What kind of favour is this, asking that Abishag the Shunammite be given to Adonijah? Why don't you just ask me to hand over the whole kingdom to him in a platter, since he is my older brother, and has Abiathar the priest and Joab son of Zeruiah on his side? Then King Solomon swore under God, May God do his worst to me if Adonijah doesn't pay for this with his life. As surely as God lives, the God who set me firmly on the throne of my father David and has put me in charge of the kingdom just as he promised, Adonijah will die for this today. King Solomon dispatched Benaiah son of Jehoiada. He struck Adonijah and he died. Amen. And I pray that God will bless this word to us, the first steps of a new king in preparation for his reign. And I want to think about what the passage says in terms of the future, the past and the present. First of all, the future. Old King David gives young Prince Solomon guidance for his way ahead. And it really boils down to two things. He says you need to think about what you're made of and the map, what you're made of and the map. The way that Solomon is made gives him the potential to follow the map that has been prepared for them, and then he will be able to take the right route through the future and always be in the place where God expects him to be. What we are made of, of course, well, we are made out of the dust of the ground. That's how Genesis accounts for the creation of Adam in the beginning of the Bible. But into that dust made man, God breathed his spirit and made us in his image. And so along with all our physical capabilities comes this almost divine discernment of the plans and the purposes of God. When God speaks to us, we hear the echo of his voice in our own thinking. Our consciences recognize the wisdom of what he says and our lives submit to his authority. So we are made not to do our own thing, not to be rebels against God, because that's to rebel against our own human nature as well as God created it. We are made to be servants of God. So show what you're made of. David's not just asking Solomon to pull himself up to his full height and do his best. He's also asking him to reflect on the purpose for which he has been put in the world as a steward of what has been created, but subject to the plans and the purposes of God. So we have within us what it takes to respond to God's word, and we have God's word, which interestingly David is able to describe as a life map for the future or signposts for the future. And when we read that, we're maybe thinking of divine intervention at critical points in our lives when decisions need to be made, perhaps a word spoken in wisdom or a message in a dream or something of that sort. But it becomes clear that the map and the signposts that David is pointing out to that will guide Solomon in the future is actually the revelation given to Moses, the words written down in the early books of the Bible which will be Solomon's guide to decision-making in the days that lie ahead. Not off-the-cuff things depending on the situation, but eternal rules and guidance and principles and values, which will apply in every situation in which he finds himself. We live in changing times, and the shape and form of what we do is always being revised, but the principles that God has laid down in his word, which reflect his own native character, the character of the one in whose image we are made, that never changes. And so the way that we are made draws our attention to the map that we have been given and gives us a guide into the future. And of course, that journey following the map and the signpost is not just through this life, but into the next. The story, first part of it, concludes with David joining his ancestors when he was buried in the city of David. The Bible describes what happened to his body. It was laid in the ground. But before that, what happened to him? He was joined together with those who had gone before. He had, com he had completed his life in isolation on earth and has now gone on to be together with all those who also 
loved the Lord. I was speaking to someone recently asking how they were, and they said, well, I'm alive and well. But then they went on to say, one day I'll be dead and better. And that's a profound statement of the truth of Christian faith, reflected also by Paul in his letters, that we follow the map in this life, doing our best to find the right route. But the place we are heading for, the place we're being taken to in the end, is the most wonderful destination of all and the conclusion to the journey to which we are always looking forward. So David prepares Solomon for the future, but then there come these reflections on the past, which might make us uncomfortable because he instructs Solomon to deal with both Joab, son of Zeruiah, and Shimei, son of Gera, the one who had rebelled against him and the other who had cursed him viciously. And both of these men had been allowed to live and prosper in David's life. In fact, David sometimes even turned to Joab for further help after the things he blames him for here. And it seems a shame to us that David is passing on grudges to his son Solomon when he himself has done nothing about it in the course of his own life. But there is also wisdom there. David may well be confessing his regret. I should have dealt with these situations earlier. He certainly doesn't want his son Solomon to be left with the naive view of the people round about us. It's good for us to be generous hearted and open minded and trusting and forgiving. But we also need to be realistic in the world to the problems of human nature and the particular human beings who are around about us. Some in our friendship group, some in our church, some in our political circles some in the other parts of the community where we live. There are people who have caused problems in the past to us and those we love. And while we deal with them as Christians, we don't meet them with our eyes closed. We recognize the legacy that has been left by upset and hardship. And we need to protect one another from that because if experience is not used to protect us, then those who are vulnerable will be hurt again. But alongside these two grudges about Joab and Shimei, it's important to notice that David also remembers the sons of Barzillai the Gileadite who showed kindness to him and hospitality. And that too is something Solomon needs to take account of going forwards. And probably that's a lesson that we could all learn from. The complaints that we receive, the grudges that we feel, the bitterness which is in our heart, the disappointments we have endured, the unkindness we have received, are things which live long in our memories and shape our actions and our attitudes towards other people. And sometimes the kindness, the sympathy, the support, the generosity goes almost unnoticed. We take that for granted. That too is human nature. We feel the barbs of criticism more fiercely than the acts of kindness, which are gentle and soft. But David deliberately takes notice of the goodness that has been done to him and says that too should be recognised, remembered and repaid. A bit like Jesus when he divides into sheep and goats, those who have served his way and those who haven't. He remembers the cups of water given, the visits to the sick in prison, the other acts of kindness shown as if to him by those who were his sisters and brothers. So we need to be realistic about the people round about us and protect ourselves from those who would harm us. But we also need to be uh, noticing of the goodness and responsive to that so that the encouragement that we have received can be returned. So we have the future, a map marked out for us that we are made to follow, and we have the past that we need to protect ourselves from, but also learn to appreciate. And then we have finally this incident in the present, when Adonijah, the candidate for king who lost the throne, comes cap in hand to Bathsheba, Solomon's mother, and asks for a favour. And Bathsheba seems to be moved by his request. Perhaps she feels sorry for him. She recognises young love when Adonijah desires to have the Shunammite as his wife. And she decides in a very tender way to do what she can to make it possible. Agrees to go to her son Solomon and ask for a favour. And Solomon warms to the occasion. His mother comes in. He sits her on a throne and everything is set for a kindly family chat. And then the truth emerges that what Adonijah wants is the old king's wife. He wants to make her his own, which would have been a deeply significant political gesture. If he had the 
old king's wife, then he might as well have the old king's crown, which is exactly what Solomon recognises in his wisdom as the ulterior motive. Adonijah pays for his mistake with his life, and that was probably what the peace of the kingdom needed. Solomon couldn't live with a powerful, ambitious rival who hadn't yet given up his claim to the throne beside him. The warning for us is to be aware of the temptation that comes when it's wrapped up in these gentle, persuasive ways. Adonijah seems to admit defeat, comes to ask for a favour, comes through a friend of the king, does everything possible to make his request seem as innocent as possible. And it would have been easy for Solomon, the magnanimous victor in a forgiving mood, to have conceded to the request, which would then have played out badly for him in the years to come. We need to be trusting, we need to be loving, we need to be generous, we need to be forgiving, but we also need to be responsible to the God who has given us the authority and responsibility that we have as sons and servants of the King of Kings living our lives in the world. People will come to us gently suggesting that we do things that would be contrary to the will of God or undermine our security and our peace of heart and mind, things we will pay for later if we are moved by the gentle requests without carefully thinking about the long-term consequences. The map that is given to us in the Word of God must be applied to the situations that we find ourselves in so that the direction that we take in response to them all is right and proper and wise. Let us pray and thank you, Father, that you have made us in your image with the potential to hear your voice echoing in our ears. Speak to us plainly and fill us with a knowledge of your word now so that when the times for decision comes, we are equipped to know your purpose, your character and your will. We thank you for the experience of others round about us and pray that you would keep us safe from those who have hurt others in the past and might hurt us again now. We ask that you would grant us the wisdom to see the danger that is coming and to shield ourselves from the fiery darts of the evil one with all the protective armour that you provide. But we also thank you for those who have blessed us and ask today that you would show us ways that we can appreciate and encourage and respond with gratitude to those who have blessed us along the way. But we pray also that you would keep us awake and alert to the dangers that we face so that we are not sucked in by gentle words into sin or shame or discomfort or disgrace. Help us to know your purposes, to see clearly the end towards which we are heading and the reason for which we have been called and the God with whom we live in the power of the Holy Spirit so that our lives can be worthy of you and you can be a blessing to us. Through Jesus our Lord, in whom we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining with me in this Bible reading and time of prayer today.